Hello, and welcome to I Should Say That Out Loud. I'm your host, Donna Brandel, and we are in Season 3, Episode 3. I'm excited to share some research with you today on my recent ethics course where I had to do a service project for a an underserved community of people. And I also was recently at the Autism Society of Greater Wisconsin's annual conference. I was there at a booth selling my book, Autistic Revelations. I had a great time meeting with people and talking with all sorts of people, but I also received this book in, in the folder that I received as a booth host. This is the Community Report on Autism 2023, and this was created and put together by the ADDM Network, the ADAM Network, which stands for Autism and Developmental Disabilities Monitor Monitoring Network. That's a mouthful. So I'm going to share both pieces of research and information with you, some of my own research and some of this organization's research. This organization, the Adam Network, studied 11 different states around the United States. And the states that they did this research in, here is a picture of the states that they studied, are Arizona, Arkansas, California, Georgia, Maryland, Minnesota, Missouri, New Jersey, Tennessee, Utah, and my home state of Wisconsin. They studied, I didn't look in depth at every state, but I know in Wisconsin, in Arizona, and California, they studied the counties that have the cities with the highest population and density and diversity of people and communities. And because of the areas that they targeted, they found some very interesting information about the diversity of autism and who is being diagnosed nowadays. It's good. It's, it's, a, it's good news. So they found that one in 36 eight-year-old children were identified with ASD, autism spectrum disorder, in 2020. One in 36. They also found that boys were nearly four times as likely to be identified with ASD than girls. That's this little graph right here. I'm not sure if that is accurate because I don't think that the diagnostic criteria is quite up to date yet on how autism presents differently in girls than boys. I know when I was first talking to my counselors about the possibility of being autistic, I've, I've been through several counselors. The first counselor that I had, I asked if I was autistic and he said, you're married at the time. So no, you can't be autistic. That was his criteria which that is so inaccurate now that now we know, but there are other things that are still inaccurate about the way diagnosis happens in girls and adults. And it's not correct yet. It's not up to date yet. I, um, oh, I want to talk about this so bad. I took someone very special to me to, for an evaluation and the questionnaire, the questionnaires were not, were not right. I just know they were not right. They also have found that for the first time in history, Black, Hispanic, and Asian or Pacific Islander children were more likely to be identified with autism than white children. And this graph shows that breakdown. And again, I don't know how accurate this would be or if the results would be the same if they took an analysis of all of the communities all across our country. Because... Like I said, they, in the three states that I looked at anyway, they targeted cities with very high, densely populated and diverse communities. So they didn't get out into the rural communities that are less populated and less diverse. They have less access to medical care and evaluation and the specialists um, that are needed to diagnose autism. They're just not out there in those rural com communities. So targeting the cities is really good to get this array of information to show that autism is not only diagnosed in white boys like it was many, many years ago, that it is, it's diagnosed in boys and girls in all races and ethnicities. But again, 11 states, 11 pretty urban areas. And then they have more specific information for each of the states. I, uh, I will highlight Wisconsin since that's my state. They found that one in 36, like the average for the country, for the 11 states that they studied, were 
one in 36 of the eight-year-olds were diagnosed in Wisconsin with ASD. And then in four-year-olds, it was a little different, one in 44 here in Wisconsin. And then there is a little bit of a difference between the eight-year-olds and the four-year-olds in the ethnic diversity of ASD. It's a little bit less diverse in the eight-year-olds, and it's a lot more diverse in the four-year-olds. And I have a feeling from my past experience with the Build Our Futures organization and research community in Kenosha County many years ago, that our state and our public health communities do a really good job here in this state to bring awareness and health and help to our zero to three-year-old population. And I, I believe personally, just from my gut hunch, that the reason that ASD is being diagnosed in higher percentages in these diverse populations in four-year-olds as compared to the eight-year-olds is because we focus so highly here in Wisconsin on that zero to three age group. And we really do a good job of helping parents get their kids into evaluations for different different needs that they have. So that's what I learned from this Adam Network at the conference last month. And now I'd like to share with you my research for my ethics course in this service project that I put together. And if I was really (laughs) great at technology, I would send these slides to myself to put into this episode, but I don't have time for that or the brain power or energy to do that. So I'm just going to read from my laptop here and share what I learned in my project. So I asked myself some questions. Who are children with disabilities? And I found a great quote from an article by a Dr. Carbone or Dr. Carboni in 2021 in the Pediatrics Journal. And he says that children with disabilities are defined under the Individuals with Disability Education Act, IDEA for short, IDEA, as children with individuals with disabilities, hearing impairments, including deafness, speech or language impairments, visual impairments, including blindness, serious emotional disturbance, orthopedic impairments, autism spectrum disorder, traumatic brain injury, some call that TBI for short, other health impairments or specific learning disabilities, and who by reason thereof need special education and related services. That is from Dr. Carbone from his article called Promoting Participation of Children and Adolescents with Disabilities in Sports, Recreation, and Physical Activity. And I then asked myself the question, why support children with disabilities? Now we know who they are, so why should we support them? And again, Dr. Carbone says that in the same article, the participation of children with disabilities, I have to set this down, it's getting too heavy. The participation of children with disabilities in physical activity, including adaptive or therapeutic sports and recreation, promotes inclusion, minimizes deconditioning, optimizes physical functioning, improves mental health as well as academic achievement, and enhances overall well-being. Despite these benefits, children with disabilities face barriers to participation and have lower levels of fitness reduced rates of participation, and a higher prevalence of overweight and obesity compared with typically developing peers. Pediatricians and caregivers may overestimate the risks or overlook the benefits of physical activity in children with disabilities, which further limits participation. Again, that was Dr. Carbone in 2021. I personally relate to the overestimation of parents of the risks of getting our kids with neurodiversity or disabilities or disorders outside and active. It can be very challenging (laughs) to keep our kids safe. They may have less awareness of dangers, which I experienced definitely with my son. And it was scary for me to take him golfing, for instance, because he would walk right in the path of people swinging their clubs, especially at the driving range when where there was a line of people just swinging, 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 and he'd just walk right up to them, right behind them, right through them. And, and they were focused on 
hitting their golf balls and not watching the little kids that were around. So I had to be hyper vigilant and hyper aware of where he was and what he was doing and try to explain to him the danger of walking by a swinging golf club that could knock him in the head and knock him out and cause all sorts of damage. <sighs> Sorry, couldn't see my fish. It was driving me crazy. But I still took him out golfing and I still took him to the driving range. I still had him involved with the junior golf program. And I told the instructor, the golf instructor to, well, I asked the golf instructor to keep special eye out for my son. I don't know if he heeded my warning and my plea for helping me keep my son safe, but he is doing just fine now. He, as far as I know, never got hit in the head with a golf club, but needless to say, it does take extra energy and vigilance and time and mental, emotional drain on parents and caregivers to get our kids with neurodiversity and disabilities and disorders outside and into the, the open air and get active out there. But the benefits so far outweigh the risks that it's so important to get their brains out into nature to experience all the vast sensory things that are out there seeing all the colors. I'm looking outside right now. That's why I keep looking that way to the, the blue sunny skies and the green leaves that are growing right now. It's May in Wisconsin. It's going to be in the seventies today to get them outside to feel the breeze on their skin, the sun hitting their skin, um, splashing in the water and even getting dirty in the mud and the sand is even better it may freak them out. It may freak the parents and caregivers out because we may have sensory issues, but it's important to get their uh, brain to experience these things and have the firing of the synapses going off in their brains because it helps build up their brain connectivity and synapses to help them move along in their development, um, in their brain development. In, in their physical development and in the connectivity between the two, between the brain and the body in the physical interactions with the world and understanding how their body reacts, the proprioception, the interoception. We need to feel that input and experience that input in order to process what is going on in the world and how our body reacts to what's going on in the world. When our kids are young, that, that's when their brain is most active in and growing and experiencing these brain synapses firing and developing their brain. It can still happen when we're older. It's just a lot less um, active when we're older and we're, you know, developed and we're already on our path when we're older. But when the, when our kids are young, that's when they're still in development, they're still in process. So just because they may have struggles now, doesn't mean that we shouldn't get them outside. It means we should get them outside even more. It's imperative for us to get them outside to experience these things. It may be a struggle. There may be a tantrum. There may be a meltdown. There may be a, a big mess of water and mud and their clothes might get all wet and dirty. Your car might get all wet and dirty and full of mud and sand and who knows what. And your, it might trail into your house. It might require some extra cleanup later in the day. It might require an extra bath or shower, but it's worth it. And it it's important that these things happen again and again and again throughout the summer months, even throughout the winter months. We can get them outside. If you're even if you're watching this in the winter, it might be snowing right now. There might be ice on the limbs of the trees. Get them outside to watch the snowflakes falling to feel the cold air in their lungs, to see the branches snapping under the weight of the ice hanging on the branches, to watch the squirrels, the birds, the animals. There's turkeys everywhere right now here in Wisconsin, and there's deer everywhere. As adults, we can take these things for granted and just get so used to them and underappreciate the value of nature. But for kids, to experience these things and to have their brains literally firing and growing and making connections between their brain processing in the, these sensory inputs and how their body reacts to all of that is so extremely important. I implore you to please 
take take whatever steps necessary to get your kids outside. Get help. Bring their grandparents. Bring your parents. Bring the neighbors. Look at your community's recreational activities. Find a trail to walk or hike. Get creative. You know, bring some Tupperware outside and spoons and splash around in a puddle with it. Have fun. And um, tell me, let me know what you did, how it went, if there was a struggle, how you overcame the struggle, if there was a moment of beauty, I would love to hear that too. If there was uh, an aha moment that your child had, uh, or that magical moment of wonderment that they, that you can see on their face as they see a bug or a bird or an animal, capture it with photos and videos too. Um, Those are precious moments. For sure. Then I asked myself the question, why support children with outdoor recreation? So I just went off on a tangent ahead of sharing this slide with you. But I'm going to go back and read this slide anyway. So this is an article by Dr. Durkin, who says that the prevalence of children in the U.S. with developmental disorders has been increasing because of improvements in child survival rates and knowledge and awareness of development and related disorders. Greater than one in six children are now being diagnosed with developmental disabilities. One in 36 children are being diagnosed with autism, but one in six are being diagnosed with developmental disabilities. That's a bigger umbrella than just autism. And some children may have both autism and other things. Dr. Durkin, his article was also in the Pediatric Journal, and his article was called Increasing Prevalence of Developmental Disabilities Among Children in the U.S., a Sign of Progress mark, and that was from 2019. And he's questioning if it's a sign of progress because, it, again, the, the reason that the prevalence of developmental disabilities is increasing among children is because of survival rate, which is great an increase in awareness and evaluation of children, which is progress, so that we can understand them better and better help them as their parents and caregivers. My last article to answer my question, why support children with developmental disabilities and disorders with outdoor recreation, is this article from Dr. Antova in 2020 that says, outdoor play and outdoor lessons have an impact on subsequent indoor learning, decreasing stress and increasing focus, attention, motivation, and engagement with material. And that is from several authors. Antova and Graham are two of the authors, and the article is entitled, Experiencing Nature Supports Cognitive and Learning Benefits. And this is from greenschoolyards.org. So like I said, Getting the kids outside increases those brain synapses that helps their understanding of how the world works, how their body relates to how the world works, and helps their brains function better in school, inside. We should get our kids outside. It's so good. It's so fun. It's better than medicine. It's better than, I don't know if it's better than healthy food. Healthy food is really good and really important, but it's, it's, it's a fun way to help our kids be healthy especially if we can be out there and engaging with them. Um, I want to say thank you to my instructor at my college for helping me um, with this project and wrap my brain around it and do a good job at it and her encouragement and feedback after I submitted it. Um, and she said that if if I actually did this service project, she would attend it and bring friends. So that, that was a great result. I hope that me sharing this research with you helps encourage you to get your kids outside and and increase and improve your network of support people to help you get your kids outside. I understand it might be near impossible to do by yourself, but there are great supports and communities out there to help you. I know that MOPS, Mothers of Preschoolers, is a great organization for moms. And they are all over the country and all over the world. So if you look for them in your area, you will probably find a MOPS group. And they will help you find other moms in your area with children similar to yours, with neurodiversity, with neurodiversity, with developmental disorders, and neurotypical children too, of course. 
So don't go it alone. Find support. Get outside. Enjoy the outside with your kids. And let me know how it goes. Let me know um, what questions you have, what other ideas you have for support, for doing things that are fun outside. If you give me a task, I will research it and give you an answer. I love to research and put information together. So thank you so much for all that you do for your neurodiverse kids, for your neurotypical kids. I should say that out loud. I did say that out loud, and I'm glad that I did. I hope you are too. Thanks. Have a great day. Bye-bye.